since we started five years ago. Those of you who have come through these doors, who in here has accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior since five years ago? All around, look at this, all around the room. Amen. Amen. God, God started making all things new. You know, uh, we, and there's a lot more too. Uh, there's, we have, we have some people who are out of town right now there. We've got, there's a lot of people who have come through the doors of this church where God has connected his son to their life. And it's been amazing. It's been an amazing uh, trip that we've been able to, uh, amazing journey that we've been able to be part of because of what God's been doing. And I want to thank you all for helping us celebrate this today. It is, it's our five-year anniversary. We are five years old. We're really getting up there in age. We are, we are really cruising now. Five years old. Uh, we're still a young church. But to see what God's been doing through the years in this church is amazing. Uh, God is so, so good. I want to I wanna take a few minutes to reminisce about how this all began and some concerns that came with it. Um, if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Exodus chapter 3 with me, we're going to start there this morning. But before we go to the uh, scripture, I want to share with you what it looked like in the beginning, in the planning stage of this church. Matt Deshaun and his family lived in Kentucky. <clears throat> a few minutes from here, if you've been there. <laughs> so quite a ways down the road. They lived in Kentucky, and my wife and I were here in St. Joseph, and w actually Matt was looking for a pastor, a pastor at somewhere. He was looking for a church to pastor. So was I. We were calling all around the country trying to find churches who were looking for pastors because we, we knew what God was doing in our hearts. We didn't know what it looked like, what his plan was, but we did know that he was working in our heart to be part of a church and help a church grow. That's where his heart was. That's where my heart was. So we were both looking for a church. I actually went out to Ohio to candidate for a church out there, and the Deshaun's drove uh, from wherever you guys were in Kentucky up to Ohio there to just support us while we were looking to, for a church that needed a pastor. They came and they supported us there and that door shut pretty quick. We didn't take that church, as you know. We didn't, I'm not there. So uh, we didn't accept that position. But the more we looked, the more we realized uh, God's doing something different. He's doing something really different. Five years and a couple months ago is when this whole thing started. I called Matt and I told him that I believe that God was wanting to start another church here in St. Joseph, Missouri. My whole life, I have heard many traditional sermons. Growing up, I, I was in church, I think I was in church the week after I was born, or at least the Sunday after I was born. I don't remember. It's been a long time. I don't, my memory is foggy there. But I think I was in church the first week I could be in church. I've been in church my whole life. And I've heard a lot of traditional sermons, and not all of them were bad. Uh, many, many, many good sermons. But many of them stood in contradiction to what the Bible actually said. And as I mentioned before, I do not believe that anyone was trying to steer anybody wrong. A lot of, a lot of times what we do is we end up preaching what we've learned, what pastors have taught us. So you preach what you've been taught. But if you look at the scripture closely, a lot of times you can find out that that's traditional teaching and not necessarily scriptural teaching. And so I had a lot of questions, and um, I realized you've got to be careful when you look at scriptures. You've got, you got to make sure it's in context. That's really important. Context is so important when you're reading scripture. Make sure the scripture is in context. Your, your opinion, your preference, and tradition do not matter. Scripture complements scripture. Scripture stands. It doesn't need our help to stand. It'll stand on its own. And that's where my heart was. And this is the issue God laid on my heart. We need to take a closer look at what the Bible is actually teaching, not necessarily what somebody taught us, because they might be teaching what somebody taught them, and they trusted the people before them, and it just keeps going back. And we might be preaching something that's traditional and not necessarily scriptural. So it's so important to take the Word of God within its context. When I called Matt and asked him if he would be interested in starting a church, he revealed a level of crazy I didn't know anybody could be at. 
Matt was the perfect fit to help start this church in St. Joseph. Within a couple weeks, they packed up everything and they moved to St. Joseph only to find out when they got here, there was no place to unload their truck. And by later on that afternoon, they had found somewhere and we went and helped them unload their truck. I mean, they were driving here with no real destination. They just packed it all up and came this way. I'm telling you, there's a level of crazy in that family that runs true. <laughs> it, it, yeah, there you go. There's their daughter just taking all of it right there. Like they, they but it's a, it's, and I mean that as a compliment. It takes a special kind of people to do that. And they packed it all up and they headed our way. And we found a hole in the wall building downtown uh, that, that where we started this church and we got to work. It took us a few months or it took us a month to flip that building into something that we could actually use as a church. And at the end of the service today, we'll show a video and you'll see some pictures of from back then. We started on May 22nd, 2016 with 11 people. And Satan had a few questions he wanted me to take into consideration. He's, Satan loves to help. He loves, hey, we, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? He had a few things he wanted me to take into consideration. How were we going to pay for things we needed? Like, have you thought about that? How are you going to pay for things? Like, oh, yeah. We didn't have a church that was assisting us. We didn't have a parent church that was helping us out. We didn't have a large following of people coming. We had 11 people. So the first question was, where, how are we going to pay for whatever comes next? How are we going to do this? And what if nobody comes? You're saying through that one out there, what if nobody ever comes? Oh, well, that would be a problem. A church of 11, staying 11 forever. That, that seems small. And what if people aren't willing to let go of some of those traditional teachings and, and look at Scripture for what it says? What if, what if that's not something they want to do? And what if the church gets so big? How about this? What if, well, let's look at the other side. What if the church gets so big that you have to quit your job? Because I was working another job at the time. So, yeah, then I, what, what would happen if the, the people, the amount of people came in and I needed to devote more time to the people than I, and I have to quit my job. Satan just wanted me to think of these things because he cares so much. So he just, a couple things he wanted me to take into consideration. And I remember going to God after I started thinking about those things a little over five years ago. So today I'm going to preach a sermon to you that God preached to me that day because that's only fair. He, God laid a message on my heart that day and I, five years later I'm going to give that message to you. In Exodus chapter 3, God calls Moses to deliver the Israelites from Egyptian bondage. And during this conversation that God is having with Moses, Moses presents a few questions that he wants God to take into consideration. Like, uh, there's a couple issues I want to present to you, God. You're calling me to do this job, and I'm going to, we should talk. We should talk. So let's start in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 11. It said, but Moses said to God, who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Here's the first hypothetical that Satan loves for us to dwell on. I'm not good enough. How could God ever use me? I'm not qualified. The first thing we start doing when, when God starts stretching us is we start looking at ourselves personally. It's like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's a little over. That's, that's outside of my pay grade. Uh, that God, I know what you want to do, but who am I? Who am I to do this? Moses felt like the task was too big for him to take on. I mean, you're only taking a couple million people out of Egypt. I mean, anybody can do that, right? So he's like, that job's a little big. I, the, who am I that I should do this? Now I'm going to take you back five years and let you see what was going through my mind at the time when we were when we were talking about starting this church. I was terrified that was what was going on. You should have heard the screaming that was going on inside of my head at that time. I was terrified. God was stretching me and I did not like it. Oh, I was willing to be stretched. I was at that place. I was willing to be stretched, but it was uncomfortable. I didn't want to be stretched because when God stretches you, he always stretches you outside of your comfort zone. 
You know, that bubble, that's what he's stretching. They're like, no, I like it in here. I really, I like it in here. And God's like, you should see what I'm going to do outside of that. Yeah, send me a picture. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. It's, it's uncomfortable. So God was stretching me outside of my comfort zone. Pastors are just like everybody else. We are just like everybody else. God is helping us grow one step at a time too. We are just people growing and God is stretching us one day after the other. We are, we are just people being stretched by God like anybody. We are just being stretched. Moses was struggling with the hypothetical situation of feeling unqualified. So God reassures him that it's going to be okay. Look at verse 12 of Exodus chapter 3. So he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. We're just going to go ahead and be real with each other for a second this morning. We all understand that God is going to be with us no matter what. We do understand that, right? We understand that God, he's faithful. He's going to be with us all the way. But that doesn't stop us from getting buried under the circumstances sometimes. Let's just be real. Yeah, we all understand. Is God ever going to leave you? Not a chance. What are you worried about? Well, there's this and that and this and that and, and this over here and that over there. And we just get really worried. But don't you know that God's going to be with you? Yes. But the truth is we do get buried under the circumstances sometimes. That's just the reality of it. Satan always has another angle he would like you to take into consideration. <laughs> He's always going to present it to you. God encourages Moses by telling him that he's going to be right next to him the whole way. I'm coming with you. I'm going to be with you the whole time. Then Satan whispers, <clears throat> have you told him about the problem? Have you told him about the problem? And Moses is like, oh yeah, oh yeah, the problem. God, I need to tell you about the problem. There's a problem. I'm sure God was like, oh, I didn't know about that. So yeah, let's talk about the problem. So Moses is like, yeah, I need to tell you about the problem. So let's look at uh, chapter 4 in verse 10. Then Moses said to the Lord, oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So Moses says, God, I have a peach impediment. I don't talk so good or well. I'm not, I, uh, wrong guy, wrong guy. I've got a problem, God, I, and I think you should be informed. I'm not eloquent. I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. Satan wanted Moses to consider everything before he decides to get involved in this obedience thing. Before you get involved in this obedience thing, Moses, you need to consider all the angles. Who are you that you should do this? Oh, that's a big job. Have you told him about the problem? That's a good point. I should tell him about the problem. I should let him know that I, I'm not good. I'm, I'm not the public speaker. I'm not, I'm not that guy. So yeah, I should inform God of everything here. Yeah, Satan's just saying, yeah, you definitely don't want to get in over your head in obedience. You don't want to do that. What if it doesn't work out? What happens? So Moses informs God about his tongue. Like, oh, okay, you need, to know, you need to know this, God. And I love the fact that God answers Moses' concern with a few questions of his own. Don't you love it when people answer your question with a question? God does the same thing. Look at verse 11 of Exodus 4. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now don't miss the point of God's question here. It's simple. Does your problem involve anything I created? Just think of that. Does your problem involve anything I've created? This question eliminates like half of our problems in life. Does it involve anything I created? The manufacturers usually know more about the product than the owners do. If God says he can use your tongue to deliver a message, he knows he can use it. I, I can use you. Yeah, but I've got a problem. I made it. It's, it's okay. It's all right. I know how that works. I'm the manufacturer. It, it's all right. We're going to be okay. He doesn't need us to change his mind. If God says he can do something, he can really do it. He knows what he's talking about. These are problems we would be better off yielding over to God. Does it involve anything I created? Yes. I got it. I got it. I know how all that works. 
yield that one over to me. Moses saw this as a problem, but it never was. God had it all under control. If it was truly a problem, God would not have requested this. But God did request it, so it's not a problem. It's not going to be a problem. The first problem, God answers by telling Moses that I, he will be with him the whole way. I'm coming with you too. We're going to do this together, Moses. I'm not just sending you off alone. I'm going to be with you all the way through it. The second problem, he's reminded that God is the creator. Just remember, I'm the one that made all this. It's, it's all right. I'm going with you, and I'm the one that created it. The third problem is where things get tricky, though. God asked Moses to go. Moses is God's messenger. He is to tell Pharaoh that God has sent him to deliver Israel from Egyptian captivity. This is where Satan offers him a concern that cannot be answered. Satan works his way up. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? What about this one right here? So Satan offers him a concern that cannot be answered. Look at chapter 4 and verse 1. Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. Here's the question. What if they? What if they? If Satan can get you lost in this question, he's got you where he wants you. What if they? What if they is the question that is always outside of your control? Always. It's, you cannot control that one. What if they? Trying to control the outcome of this type of question will paralyze you. Oh, what if they? What if they? What if they? You can't solve that one. So Satan presents this one too. What if they? They are not something you ever have control over. We do, I hope we all understand that. They is something I can't fix. I can't do anything about that. You can do everything right, and some of they will still have a problem with you. It will always be this way. They are out of your control. They even had issues with Jesus Christ. <laughs> this is a problem that Satan's going to, yeah, but what if they... What if they don't come to your church? What if they don't like your preaching? What if they would rather have different colors in the church scheme? What if they, what if they, what if they? Those are always outside of your control. But Satan always wants to present that to you before you move forward in that obedience area. Consider this question too. What if they, what if they judge me? What if they don't like me? What if they, what if they, what if they? They will always have the option to behave however they want to behave. That's just the truth of it. So how does God respond to that question? He gets Moses to focus on what he has. Look at verse 2 of chapter 4. So the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? And he said, A rod. Moses said, What, is that? Uh, what if they? And God says, What is that? Just change the whole subject right there. Yeah, but what if they, what if they? And he says, what is that? Moses wants to fix a hypothetical problem he doesn't even have yet. And God points to a solution that Moses already possesses. You see, God has already been planning to use Moses and that rod to show his wonders to the world. I already have a plan here. You have everything you need right now. What if they, what is that? It's a stick. Plenty. We got it. We got this. You and that stick. Let's do that. Yeah, but what if they? No, no, no. The plan involves you and the stick. I don't understand. Well, trust me. It's really going to be cool. Trust me. We're going to do things that are amazing. We're going to do them together. I'm going with you. I'm not qualified. I'm more than qualified. Let's just do this together. But what if they? What is that? What is that? Let's change the question. You're saying, what, is the, what if they, and I just want to change it to, what do you have? What do you have? Let me use what you have. Moses doesn't understand that he is in the best position for success, as is. As is. What he has available to him is all that he needed to change the world, even though it doesn't seem like much. I'm going to change the world for millions of people real soon here. All I've got is a stick. It's plenty, plenty. You've got everything you need. A stick and God is more than anybody else has. 
throw the stick away and you still got plenty. God, God is enough. Just trust him. So Moses presented several problems to God, but the truth is he only had one problem. Moses only truly had one problem. We can look back at the outcome and see that all of his concerns were actually a waste of time. Knowing the outcome really does help us understand how things work. It's always nice when you look back and see it's all done. Like, yeah, that all makes sense. That whole process makes all the sense in the world. Moses wasn't looking from our direction. He was looking forward. Yeah, none of this makes sense. Oh, yeah, Moses, everything's fine. We read the story. I didn't have that story. I was living that story. So yes, it's always nice looking from that direction, but Moses didn't get that benefit. He was looking forward. Having all the details, we can easily tell Moses it's best to trust God on this one. All I have is a stick. Yeah, just watch. He will blow your mind with that rod. Just take that and everything's going to be fine. It's easy for us to say that since we can read the story. Moses didn't know the details we know. But Moses did have all, he didn't have all the details, but he did assume that he had all the problems because he's looking forward, not back. I don't have the details, but I've got a lot of problems. I've got a lot of problems. But he only legitimately had one problem. That's all he had, just one problem. And it wasn't his speech. And it wasn't the fact that he was not qualified enough. Those weren't his problems. It wasn't even what other people might think. What if they? Those weren't his problems. Moses' problem was the same as the majority of our problems. Most of our problems in life don't come from our circumstances. They come from our thoughts. That's where our problems come from. But, but have you seen my circumstances? Well, if you would see them a different way, you'd see them as different circumstances. We have a thought problem. That's the only problem that Moses was actually dealing with was his own thoughts. Moses was spending a lot, of times a, a lot of time asking questions that didn't need answers, so God responded with questions that actually did need answers. Moses says, who am I? And God responds with, oh, but who am I? Who am I? Moses says, what about my speech? And God says, who made your mouth? <coughs> That's a good question. That's a good question. Moses says, what if, they, what if they, and God says, what is that? These are good questions to answer. God's questions were actually important to have answers for. Moses' questions were hypotheticals. They weren't even things that happened. Moses' problem wasn't his situation, it was his mindset. Satan loves to meet us during the thought process. He loves to meet us during the thought process. God knows this, so he tells us to get ready for it. Satan's going to meet you. Where's he going to meet me? Wherever you're thinking. Oh, if you're in the thought process of, of following God, Satan's going to show up with a few concerns. God knows this is going to happen, so he tells us to get ready for it. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Brace yourself. Satan knows how to take us down. He's been studying your life from your very first breath. He's been watching you. He knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. He's been studying your life. Brace yourself. He's going to meet you right in that thought process. Five years ago when this church was in the planning stage, Satan presented every concern for us to take into consideration. You bet, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Are you scared? Terrified. Terrified. Yeah, it was a scary time. What if this happens? What if that happens? Think about it all. There were many times where moving forward was a terrifying thought. That's when we realized that it was just the thought that was terrifying. It was all what was happening here. It was the thought that was terrifying. It couldn't have been the action because the action hadn't happened yet. Think about that. A lot of times we think, well, that's a scary thought. We'll narrow it down. That's all it is, is a scary thought because it hasn't happened yet, so it can't be anything other than a thought. That's where you're at, and that's where Satan wants to meet you, right there in the thought process. If I can catch you at the thought process, I'll never have to deal with you in the action process. Let's stop you at the thought process. Satan's always faithful there. I will be there. I will just present some concerns for you to take into consideration. What if this? What if that? What if they? Think about them all. And if you get caught in the thought process, you'll never have to worry about addressing the actions. 
Well, we realized that it was just the thoughts that were terrifying, not the reality, because the reality hadn't happened yet. The thought of starting a church without finances or backing of any kind was a frightening thought. It was a frightening thought. <laughs> but to think that God could do it anyway, now that was exciting. Like, yeah, it's terrifying, but what if God could do it anyway? That's exciting. That, that was worth pursuing. And believe me, as I said at the beginning, the Deshaun's were just crazy enough to say, Let's, <laughs> we're going to jump in with you. Let's do this together. They had the, it, Faith without risk doesn't require faith. There, there's no faith there. If we had all the answers, it wouldn't be called faith. So there, had to be, there has to be a risk element there. And the Deshaun said, let's go ahead and do that. And my in-law said, hey, we're in. We're in. Let's do this. We had 11 people. We had 11 people. Say, so all right, let's move forward. Anybody scared? Uh-huh. All of us. All of us. This is scary. Do we have every reason not to do it? Yes. Let's do it anyway. Because we have every reason, reason to do it. What if God does this? That's an exciting idea right there. We just had to understand how, how hard Satan was fighting against us. We had to all understand that and how powerful an unhealthy mindset could be in helping him do that. We all had to understand that. God was working in our lives and we had to retrain our thoughts even then. We had to lay our concerns to the side and trust that God has this. Is he going to go with us? Yes. Are we qualified? He is. He's qualified. But we don't have anything. Anybody got a stick? <laughs> we can start there. We, we can start there. Just if he called us to do it, then we've got everything we need to do it. We just need to trust him. We had to train our minds to understand and to trust God in all of this. I remember sitting with my wife and Matt and Kim at a little patio table on their, uh, at their house. We were trying to figure out what the name of the church would be. We were trying, I remember asking Matt, who's going to pastor? I, I was going to say I lost, but I won. It all depends on how you look at that. But I did, I drew that straw. I'm like, why is my straw shorter than yours, Matt? You know, what, what happened? No, we prayed about it. We put a lot of prayer into it. And Matt, we, we understood how to move forward. Did it scare me? Yes, I'm just going to be honest with you. It scared me. And Matt gave me the same line he always gives me. I'll be praying for you. <laughs> I'll be praying for you. But they have stood by, by us all the way. We, we couldn't have done it with all of you. All, without all of you. And we do appreciate what God's done through every person in this church. But I remember sitting there at that patio table. Trying to figure out what to name the church. And that's when we not only figured out the name, but the purpose. And it came with that verse, Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Look at this with me, Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Renew. That was the message, and we heard it loud and clear. Renew. This is what God wanted from us, and this is what God wanted us to teach other people. Satan attacks us on the battlefield of our mind. Any problem that you're going to face, remember Satan's there in the thought process. He's going to attack you right there. He cannot make us do anything. Satan doesn't have that kind of power. He cannot make us do anything. So he must convince us that our desires, or that his desires, are also our desires. That's the only thing he can do. He just try to convince us that what he wants is also what we want. Satan's only weapon is deceit. That's the only thing he's got in his arsenal, is deception. He can tempt us to do or to think something, but he cannot force us to do it. He does not have that power. He does not have that authority. The only time we behave the way he wants us to is when we think the way he wants us to. Just think about that. The only time we behave the way Satan wants us to is when we start thinking the way he wants us to. Because our thoughts produce our actions. That's why God constantly reminds us in Scripture, renew your mind. Renew your mind. 
If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, your old self died. God made all things new. Your old self died. But God knows the way you used to think and operate. He understands how we used to do that. But you are a new person now. You have a new heart and you have a new spirit. That's what happens at salvation. God doesn't want you to operate according to the pattern of old programming. The way you used to do it, no, let's do it this way now. Let's make all things new. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22. That you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Does life get difficult sometimes? Yes, it, it does. Life does get difficult. Do people have the potential to get under your skin? Just be honest. Yes. Yes, there's that potential. That can happen. Is it possible to feel overwhelmed and out of control? Yes, it, yes, it is possible. The only way you will ever be taken down by these things is if you allow Satan to get a foothold in your thought process. You can't let him get that far. Do not let him get involved in the thought process. Our job as Christians is not to control, but to yield to God. Yield it to God. Whatever your situation is, yield that over to God. That's our responsibility. I'm going to do this just as Christ would do it if he was in my situation. I'm going to yield this over to God. Satan wants to be part of your think tank. He, he's ready. You get that meeting around the table of your mind, he's sitting there too. Let me, let me throw a few ideas out at, at you. When you sit down to your me, myself, and I meeting, just remember Mr. Me Too has a few things he wants to bring up for consideration. Now, have you considered this? Have you thought about this? What, what would that guy think? What about her? You know, what will happen? Don't get too involved in the obedience department before you take these things into consideration. He's always there to voice his opinion. He would love to take your thoughts into captivity. But God has offered you a safeguard against that. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. If your thoughts are consumed with glorifying and honoring God, there is no room for Satan's suggestions. If you will bring your thoughts into captivity of Jesus Christ, I'm all about you, God. I'm all about you. Satan says, I've got a suggestion. Yeah, go. Go. I'm all about him. I have brought my thoughts in the captivity of Jesus Christ. There's no room for your suggestions. I'm all in. I'm all in. When you got saved, God's first word of advice for you was renew. Renew. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Renew your mind. Protect your thoughts. Why? Because Satan, just because you got saved, doesn't mean Satan's done with you. He wants to play too. Bring your thoughts into the captivity of Jesus Christ. Renew. It's time to renew your mind. It's, it's time for all of us to renew our minds. If Satan cannot affect your thoughts, he cannot affect your actions. Renew. Renew. We spend so much time asking questions that don't need to be asked. We remind ourselves of the questions that offer no solutions. What about this? What about that? Maybe we should remind ourselves of the questions that actually offer solutions instead. When we say, God, who am I? Just remember he said, but who am I? Who am I? When we say, think, God, I can't, I just can't. Who created you? Who's, who's your creator? Now that's a good question. That, that, one, that one has an important answer. When we say, what if they? God says, what is that? It's a stick. You should see what I can do with a stick. <laughs> what do you have? I only have a little bit. Just a flashback. What did God create everything out of? Nothing. So that means whatever you have is way more than enough. 
If God can make everything from nothing, then He can use whatever you have to offer, even if it's just a little bit. He's such an amazing God. He's such an amazing God. God will always go with you. He is your creator, and He has equipped you with everything you need to move forward for Jesus Christ. Our job is to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That's our job. I want to close with the book of Philippians. If you're ever struggling, I recommend that you go to this book and understand its background and its message. Philippians is an amazing book of the Bible. If you're having a bad day, open up Philippians. Just start reading it. It'll help. I promise you it'll help. Paul wrote this book from prison. He was in a situation he did not deserve to be in. He was thrown into prison. He's been beaten. He's in prison. And he writes the book of Philippians. This book is filled with so many encouraging verses. And maybe some of them are familiar to you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, that's a good verse. That doesn't sound like somebody writing from a prison. I can do all things. What are you able to do right now? I'm kind of locked up. I'm, yeah, what are you talking about? It means when I'm in the bad times, I can make it. When in the abased times, in those times where I abound, I can do both. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He who has begun a good work will be faithful to complete it. That verse is in Philippians also. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. These are verses we're familiar with. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching towards those forward towards those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. These are familiar verses to us. How was Paul able to write such a powerfully encouraging book while in prison? It's because nobody was able to throw all of Paul into prison. They, they couldn't throw all of Paul in there. They might have been able to put his hands in his feet in shackles. They may have been able to throw his body into the dungeon, but the one thing they could never get locked down was his mind. You can't have my mind. We're trying, and you can't have it. You can't have it. In this prison epistle, in the book of Philippians, Paul writes down something he wanted us all to remember. Look at this verse. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus yielded everything to the Father. Everything. Even when Satan tried to take residence in Jesus' mind, there was no vacancy. Because he was in obedience to the Father. Five years ago was a scary time for Renew. There were 11 of us. We were all freaking out alone. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for joining through the years and helping us move forward here. But it was a scary time for all of us. There a lot of unknowns were happening. And Satan was fighting, but we learned that it was a fight in the area of hypotheticals. All hypotheticals. God taught us the importance of renewing our minds and trusting in Him. And everyone involved in the starting of this church yielded to God. And believe me, we just obeyed. God did the work. Let's not take any credit away from Him. He's the one that did it all. We just obeyed. We showed up with a stick. And God said, let's do this. And five years later, here we are. Satan wants to have place in your thought process. Understand that in your life. He wants to have a spot there. He wants a place in your thought process. If we allow it, it will change the way we treat others. It will change the way we view circumstances. And it will ultimately change the way we yield to God. Do not let Satan get involved in the thought process. If you're a child of God, represent the family in a way that reflects the character of God. Reflect Jesus Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Obedience. Obedience. And when it comes to obeying God, dealing with circumstances, defending yourself against Satan's attacks, there's only one word that you need to remember and take it to heart. Renew. Renew. Renew your mind. Five years ago, Renew started, and ever since, we've been attacking the lies of Satan with the truth of God's Word. One day after the next. Let's just keep going. Because the more we grow in Christ, the more His ways become our ways. And that's what we need to produce. Those are the actions that the world needs to see. They need to see people living the way Jesus Christ set the example to live. Follow in His steps. Keep our minds 
on Christ. Let's all keep our minds on Christ. And let's change this world for God. We have been around for five years. And I'm praying that we at least have another 200 years in us. Let's just, let's just keep going. Let's just keep going. Let's grow. Let's renew our minds. By the way, if you are here in 200 years from now, extend it. Go farther. Keep going. <laughs> keep going. God started an amazing thing with Renew Church. And he has brought a lot of people together and we are family here. We are friends. One thing we have said since the beginning is if there is a gap, watch out because there's a lot of people coming to fill that gap. That is what our church has been like since the very beginning. Is there a gap that needs to be filled? Do you have a problem? Do you need help? Hold on. We have more people than necessary, but we're here to help. We love each other. We've got relationships with each other. But it's all because we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Our minds are focused on Jesus Christ. Whatever comes your way, understand this. Satan wants to be involved in the thought process. But if you'll bring your mind into captivity of the obedience of Jesus Christ, renew your mind, you're never going to run into a single problem the rest of your life. Now you might be thinking, that was a pretty bold statement. I, that, is that even true? Well, this is what I'm saying. You'll never run into another problem. You will only run into challenges. Because with God, there are no problems. For Him, there are no challenges. But for us, it's just a challenge. Well, uh, what if they? What if that? What about? Bring your minds into the obedience of Jesus Christ. Follow Jesus Christ. Renew your mind. And let's move forward for the glory of God and let's shine the light of Christ through the through this whole community and to the rest of the world. Thank you for five amazing years. Let's just keep going. We don't need to slow down at all. Let's just keep going. But remember, day after day, one word. Remember this one word. Renew. Renew. There was a time that I swore I would never go back. I was blind to the truth, didn't know what I had I was running, I was searching But every place I turned for healing Left me more broken than the last Take me back to the place that feels like home To the people I can depend on To the faith that's in my bones Take me back to a preacher and a verse Where they've seen me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I want to go to church Trying to walk on my own But I'm wound up lost Now I'm making my way To the foot of the cross It's not a trophy for the winners it's a shelter for the sinners And it's right where I belong Take me back To the place that feels like home To the people I can depend on To the faith that's in my bones Take me back To a preacher and a verse Where they've seen me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I want to go to church It's in my bones Take me back To a preacher And a verse Where they see me at my words To the love I have